Iconic wrestling coach Dan Gable once said, Pain is nothing compared to what it feels like to quit. Give everything you've got today, for tomorrow may never come. Gable could be describing those whose achievements have earned them the honor of being inducted into the National Wrestling Hall of Fame. Etched in Stone, the stories of wrestling's legends will take you inside the lives of over 200 of the greatest wrestlers in history as they share their never-before-told stories about their trials, tribulations, and triumphs. Competitors, coaches, teammates, and those who knew these athletes best will also weigh in on their accomplishments with their own unique perspectives. Welcome to the show, folks. You're listening to The Smiths on the Etched in Stone series. My name is Ryan Warner. I'll be your host. So let's get started. After John won his first Olympic gold medal at the 1988 Summer Games, he continued his assault on international wrestling. In the following year, he won another world championship and, in an all-star meet, beat Soviet legend Sergei Belaglazov. He was on top of the wrestling world with no signs of letting up. Here we're looking at him right now. What a record he has had. Two world championships, one Olympic championship. John Smith, again, proving why he's one of the best amateur John athletes. Smith, who just well may be the best American wrestler of all time. He's by far the hottest wrestler in the United States. When John Smith would show up in the, in, in the late 80s, early 90s, it was money in the bank. This is Rich Bender, CEO of USA Wrestling. But John had that, that string of four or five years where... It didn't matter. I mean, it didn't matter what, you know, he could have everybody piled up in his side and and back-to-back have to beat the best guys in the world and, and would, would do it. But he was absolutely money in the bank in that, in that time frame. To wrestling fans, John Smith seemed invincible. But as he entered the 1990 season, trouble lurked ahead. John Smith. John Smith. John Smith. Probably the greatest wrestler we've ever had in the United States. He took it down. I see a bundle of intensity. I find a way to win. It seems incredible that a family can do that well. Three NCAA champions, the only family to ever do that. It just seems one brother after the other tries to outdo the one before him. Big win for young Pat Smith. Pat Smith, the number one seed and defending champ from Oklahoma State. It was, you know, a wrestling life. You're listening to The Smiths Episode 5. My name's Ryan Warner. I'll be your host. Now, last episode, we focused on Pat, but this time, we're going to pivot back to John. And the reason being is that after John won his first Olympic gold medal, he developed a new rivalry that would change the rest of his career. So let's pick this story up in February of 1990. At the time, John was the face of USA Wrestling and flying as high as ever. His wrestling camps were selling out as he traveled the country teaching kids a low single. Mark Branch was one of the thousands of kids who attended a John Smith camp. Yeah, I mean, he was he was at that um, kind of that, I I guess you would say that untouchable level, meaning, um, you know, John John was so big that when you go to camps, you, you didn't really ever get to say hi or talk to him or shake his hand. I mean, it was it was like in and out celebrity status, right? You come in show a low single leg and then walk out and and kids were like you know "Ah." it was just exciting i just remember Mm -hmm. those earlier years it was exciting going to you know you walk into 400 kids and their eyes are on you and you're like wow you know what what did i do you know where you won a world championship john he also dropped an instructional video hello my name is john smith how low can you go the low single leg that's what i'll be covering in this video and that's when the money began to pour in for john between the camps the VHS tape, and his custom shoes, he was flush with cash. It was just real exciting to me, and, and there was a level of, of, of me that was just like, I want, it's, this is, I'm making some real money, you know? And I never had money. And I think anytime you're making some money, real money, it's exciting. You know, it's, it's, it's you know, you just don't want to make the wrong mistakes, take the wrong step, you know? And I did that. But as John's bank account and his popularity grew, that fire on the inside that had driven him for so many years was starting to fade. And no one can explain this to me because no one's been where I've been. 
it's tough to get motivated now, to get up every day like you've been doing in the past, to train as hard as you've always trained, to win a world champion, because you've already won one. That don't mean I don't love the sport and I want to retire. I want to wrestle. I don't want to train as hard. Those are words you typically don't hear from John Smith. And his coach, Bruce Burnett, was worried. He had a lot of other things on his plate. First off, he... You live pretty meagerly, you know, as an elite athlete, especially back then, you know. And so, and all of a sudden, he's able to make some money and do some things uh, that he wasn't able to do before. I think that that draw hurt him a little bit. But nevertheless, Bruce and John flew to Cuba for an early season tune-up tournament. I didn't want to go either, by the way, and... and, um... I was told to go, basically. Well, I, honestly, so here's the deal with Cuba. First off, the time of the year that wrestlers go down there, usually it's cold at home, and they get to go to Cuba. And I hate to tell this, really, but I'm going to say 60, 70 percent of those guys that go down there are pretty big on buying some cigars and bringing them back. And so I don't think the mindset going down put them in the frame of mind that how important it really is. Honestly, we were pretty concerned about whether or not we were gonna get lobster after the matches, you know, the guy selling lobster on the beach. And so it's not the most difficult of all the, the international tours that you can take. That's what I'll say. You know that I think Italy would be there and Canada was at the tournament, but really you went down there to wrestle the Cubans because they were the toughest ones in the group. Now, Cuba produces some of the best wrestlers in the world, a skill they learned from their longtime ally, the Soviet Union. Russians turned out in thousands to show the world, and America in particular, that Nikki loves Fidel. President Castro had the red carpet treatment all the way to the Red Square. But by 1990... The Soviet Union was in the early stages of crumbling, and foreign aid to Cuba had long been cut off. Alongside evidence of great wealth, exist poverty, as grinding as can be found anywhere on the face of the earth. The situation in Cuba was bleak, and John was ready to get back to the States. But first, he had to wrestle in the Cerro Pilato tournament. Just, I can remember, it was one of those outdoor pavilions that had a, had a roof over it, but of course in Cuba, you know, I don't think there's anything indoors. Wrestling in that outdoor pavilion, John limped through the early rounds of the tournament and made it to the finals, where a young Cuban named Lazaro Reynoso awaited. For Cuba, Lazaro Reynoso. As the match started, John jumped out to an early lead, scoring a takedown with the low single. He continued to press the pace, but was stifled by the Cuban's defense. Yeah, there was a there was a conflict of style between he and I. I mean, it was just just odd. He felt odd to me, you know. Um, and when I say odd, there was guys that beat him pretty consistently at my weight that I'd tech fall, you know. Um, but for me, it was a conflict. As the match went on, John became visibly frustrated with the ref. Every time he would shoot and seemingly score, the official would stalemate the hold and bring the wrestlers back to their feet. And then late in the match, Reynoso actually countered and scored off of one of John's shots, taking the lead. Against all odds, John was unable to mount a comeback and lost 4-3. I took off running. That's all I can remember. And I remember running in some neighborhoods and... Um, people just looking at me, you know, I just could kind of remember running. They were like, who is this guy, you know? <laughs> in your singlet? In my singlet, yeah. And I just remember, you know, running right out and running, I don't know, three, four, five miles, trying to, you know, w- you know what just happened. And, um, and of course... I'm done. I'm quitting. I'm done with this. This is, you know, what what do you hear? You're not even motivated. You didn't even want to be here. The following day, John boarded a flight back to Stillwater. He'd be alone with his thoughts 
for the next six hours? You know, I think you walk off the mat and there's things that you you know you've heard and you said and people say you know I should have won that match you know I don't think I ever walked off the mat and said I should have won it you know I walked off the mat and I kind of explained a little bit why didn't I win yeah. right and and I always had the answers to why and so you, you, immediately you move forward from it you follow me? Yeah, totally. I mean, and why was always back on me. Not because uh, I didn't. I had a coach that didn't show up to practices or I had part of my partners wasn't concerned. It was never any of that. That's, that's BS. That's bullshit. You know, it always was, listen, you didn't, you didn't stay focused for long enough. You, you know, you, you, let your, you let yourself, you know, slip away with your diet. You cut too much weight coming into this event. You, did, you know, there was always, I could answer it so... There wasn't a level of anger. There was a lot of level of thought, you know, but, but mad the next day, huh? -uh. motivated the next day, excited about what I need to do, where I need to go. Uh, if you figured out some things, I, I'm better because of this loss, you know, and all of a sudden there's a level of excitement that comes from all that, you know. After John returned from Cuba, he sat down at his kitchen table, journal in hand, and wrote out, the changes he needed to make in order to regain his status as world's best wrestler. The first change was setting a budget. And one of the things I did was I took, I lived on $1,000 a month for the rest of that, my career. And I just made a point that if I'm going to train and try to be the best, um, I need to put myself in that atmosphere where it allowed me to do that and, and live in um, minimal was important to me. Um, a thousand dollars a month in in eighty nine ninety is a lot of money, you know, um, and it was enough, right? But uh, it doesn't allow you to just run off and go do things that that you, that maybe I was doing a little bit of, you know, fly fishing, certain spots in the world, and doing some things, you know, that kept me grounded and um, and you know, it just you know, it kind of just kind of refocused me in on. Just the things that that I really love, and that's winning. You know, that's wrestling and winning. You know, um, you can't buy anything. You know, no matter what kind of money you make, you can't buy anything. You can't buy uh, uh, medals. You know, you can't buy uh, that that great feeling of training and and feeling feeling the um, the excitement of. I'm getting better and I'm developing, which happened at that time for me. You can't buy that. No money's going to buy it. And so let's let's slow down. And I, I say a thousand dollars, I'd probably spend a lot less. After the budget was set, John changed his summer camp schedule so that it was relegated to non-training camp weeks. The youth of America would have to watch how low can you go if they wanted to learn the low single. My my time, I got real stingy with it. After that loss in Cuba, you know, I got real stingy and going, what are you doing here? What are we going to do here? And then I'd, I'd, I'd do maybe a few few a year, and I, I really backed way off of it because... Um, That's a grind. Well, it was a grind, and it's hard, you know, you, you're, you're getting offered some, some money that's just like, you know, that's, that's a real difference. You know, I can buy more land, you know. <laughs> um, and, um, but it, it ended that, that, it ended in... in Cuba. I backed way, way off. John was re-entering the selfish world where the priorities were simple. Training, diet, and sleep. It's, it's a self-centered world. It's, it can be a selfish world. I, I, I think when, when, you're, when you're in the process of trying to win a world championships, or win an Olympic gold medal, or you're going to win the NCAAs, if you're not focused on yourself and what your needs are and what you need to do to win that, uh, I think you're making a mistake. That's Doc Bennett. He was one of the few people inside John's inner circle. I always felt, and I, I've told athletes, and I, you know that that hey, there's a time to be selfish, and there's a time to pay back. And the time to pay back is when the journey is over, and you've got the time to really put into dedicating yourself to doing that in a proper fashion. 
John's selfishness was most pronounced during his twice-a-day workouts. Kendall Cross was now training for the Olympics himself and was one of John's main workout partners. You know, the, the thing about it was it wasn't terribly fun um, to, to work out with him because he was a little bit stingy on his drills. So John would drill the low single maybe 20 times without letting Kendall take a shot. Yeah, you got to say something. We gotta say something. Hey, it's my turn. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. He, he's he cordial about it, you know. Like, but if you let him, he'll um, take his, you know, twenty-two shots and then turn it over to you. You know, the way I look at it, he he him he drilled, um, paying attention to time versus paying attention to how many times he shot. You know, it wasn't three and three. It was you know, it wasn't two and two. It was I'm drilling, you're drilling. I'm drilling, you're drilling, you know, and it would escalate into it to a bit of a spar. You know, that was typically the way it happened. Sparring with John Smith was a gruesome affair. He approached every workout as if he was wrestling Reynoso. John was brutal because he um, had to have points. He had to be the one to score, um, would get upset if you scored, and, um, and he wouldn't be... Uh, you know, out of bounds to uh, tweak a knee um, to get to a finish and score in practice. There was just no let off, you know, no letting off. And it didn't matter who he was wrestling, college kids, coaches, he was relentless. Just ask Bruce Burnett, one of John's coaches. I told Mike Sheets one day, I said, you know, I, I think I'm gonna really try to beat John today in a match, he wants to go three or four matches today and I think I'm going to try to I'm going to really try to win and that dog got Mike Sheets went and told John and John beat me like a drum <laughs> and I, I looked over in the corner and I saw Mike Sheets just smiling you know I don't think John had ever beaten me that bad but boy he I think Mike told him and uh, I really took a beat down on that on that day but uh John could do that. He could turn it up and turn it on, you know. After a few months of training, John was starting to feel like the John Smith from the redshirt year. Edgy, hungry, and aggressive. And when he reemerged on the tournament scene in the spring of 1990, he was dominant. He was unstoppable on his feet, and he developed a top game. Kind of like MJ developing the jump shot later in his career. John Smith for the United States, one of the greatest wrestlers we've ever had in this country. A precarious situation there, and we will have a two-pointer. Nice step over by John Smith. I was just devastating on Tom, and I knew it was. I knew if I could take someone down, I could tech anyone. It didn't matter if they were a world champion or what. I had that much focus on top and, and had developed so many levels of skills that um, there was a lot of confidence. Smith able to expose the back of Kaplan once again. Has that nice 5 nothing lead right away, and you can see he's psyched up. He takes no prisoners. He comes out, and he likes to wrestle. He doesn't back off his offense at all. There's ankle lace there. Hey, what a move. That was worth one. It went from hand to hand. Another point. He's now leading 7 to nothing. Now there's another pointer. But more important than anyone's skill was John's mind. It had been calloused from years of training and from the loss to Reynoso. If I get in a tight match where it's close against a Soviet or a Bulgarian, I find a way to win. It seems like whatever I have to do, um, I do it right. You know, to explain that, I, I just can't do, you know. I know that I've been behind by a point or two with 30 or 40 seconds left, and I find a way to take the guy down to win. Second place was never an option in, in John's mind. You know, a lot of athletes, they make the finals and they look at it and they'll say to themselves internally, you know, oh, the worst I can do is second place. That was never an option for John. John, it was win or nothing. He had to win. That's Doc Bennett again. He was with John when they traveled to the 1990 World Championships in Tokyo, Japan. John was on fire in Tokyo. I mean, he was on fire there. He wrestled as good as I've ever seen him wrestle. I think maybe it may have been where he was maybe at his best at that point in time. Might have been my best tournament I ever wrestled. I really hit a, hit a level, a peak in my career that, um, I mean, I, I think I teched everyone in, in the world championships that year. 
protecting everyone you wrestle at the world championships is just stupid. It doesn't happen. Thank God Doc Bennett put a camera in John's face before the finals. And I was talking with John and, and uh, I said, are you ready for this? And he says, he says, I'm ready. He says, I've already won it. They just haven't raised my hand yet. I've done won it. I have no pressure on me. All I have to do is go out, wrestle tough. I'll win. I'll wrestle the way I'm around. In front of 10,000 fans at the Tokyo Metro Gymnasium, John breezed through his first five rounds and wrestled the Bulgarian in the finals. In the blue, Olympic champion and two-time world champion, John Smith of the United States. And John... John started the match with a darting low single to the Bulgarian's right leg. And then shortly after, he hit another. Four to nothing now, with three minutes and 34 seconds. John looked like a panther out there, bobbing and weaving, faking, darting in and out. The Bulgarian had no idea what hit him. One more point for John Smith. After he stung the Bulgarian with a third low single, he went to work on top. Smith with the leg lace, flying for some points. Two more points for John Smith. And ladies and gentlemen, for the third time, world champion John Smith of the United States. John became the first American to win four straight world championship events. Not only was he the best wrestler in the United States, he was the best wrestler in the world. After laying claim to the 1990 World Championship gold medal, John flew to Mexico for some much needed R&R, or so he thought. Yeah, I went to Cancun and all I could think about was just seemed like, what are you doing? You know, I mean, this is one week after and you're going to, you, you know, I just couldn't even reward myself. It was like I got there and I couldn't even, I was like, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Why are you here? You know, and I started, you know, running sprints along the sand and look, trying to get somebody to wrestle some, some of these, some of these people that were there trying to get them to wrestle in the water with me and some people I had met and let's come on I'll teach you how to wrestle Greco you know let's get in the and you know they were like are you crazy what are you talking about you know? oh uh, anyway it was just kind of sad that I couldn't enjoy a week off you know after cutting the trip short John returned to Stillwater and began to fester on the thought of Lazaro Reynoso you see at the world championships that year John and the Cuban didn't meet and so it didn't sit well with John that Lazaro still had a win over him. Just ask Doc Bennett, one of John's good friends. Well, Reynoso, Reynoso was on his mind a lot. He didn't like the Cubans and he didn't like Reynoso. And, and, uh, and he didn't like him because Reynoso was somebody that was... His, their styles were... Reynoso, uh, their styles were the biggest clash I think John had. Now, not long after John got back from Mexico... He received an invitation to wrestle in the Grand Championships, a one-night event where wrestlers could earn money, kind of like a UFC pay-per-view. And John's opponent that night would be none other than Lazaro Reynoso, the only man to beat him during the 1990 season. Was it personal? Um, yeah, that was personal. On December 26, 1990, John flew to Pittsburgh, weighed in, and was ready for his rematch with Reynoso. A reporter caught up to him shortly before the match. Wrestling Reynoso is um, going to be a big match for me. He, beat, he was the only guy that beat me last year in uh, 1990. Um, he beat me the first match of my 90 season, and I'm wrestling the last match tonight of 90 season. So it's a big match for me. It's a revenge match. Um, the way he celebrated his match bothered me a lot. So uh, um, I'm going to go out tonight and, and wrestle as hard as I've wrestled the whole year. For Cuba, Lazaro Renoso. He will be going against John Smith, United States, the winningest wrestler we've ever had. I think John's going to be fired up. This rematch is real important to him. He should have never lost to this guy. He lost him in Cuba. The match opened with John scoring and turning the Cuban to take a 2-0 lead. 
But then Reynoso reversed John, making it two to one. I look at a match like this, Jimmy. Reynoso has absolutely nothing to lose. Well, Reynoso hangs onto the leg, controls the arm. He doesn't want to let John Smith get behind him, but he does. Scores another point to extend his lead to three to one. Not content simply to win, John continued to punish Reynoso. Well controlled, nice little chuck by there by John Smith. It should get him one point for the takedown. Up 10 to 1 with less than 50 seconds left, John kept pushing. He wanted to humiliate Reynoso. There it is. And a two point. Oh, nice changeover. Oh, and he's arm trapped again. Putting out a little display for us here at the end. John Smith of the United States. A witness match, a blurry of action at the end. I think it will be 15 to 2. A great match tonight, John. How important was this match to you? Well, Jim, you know, he's only got his beat me in 1990, and it was um, probably one of the most important matches I've wrestled, you know, up till now. People say, well, what about the Olympics? Well, I didn't get beaten in the Olympics. This guy really gloated over me after he won in Cuba, running around me, kind of gave me a shove at the end of the match. But he got what he deserved tonight. What, what's going to keep you motivated going into this year's championship? Well, Losing, you know, um, getting caught off guard scares me, and and not being prepared is what scares me and what's motivating me. Um, you know, I know I realize now that every match I go into, they're going to be at 110 percent because they're wrestling me. So I've got to be prepared. There's no more layoffs from here on until the Olympics. It's continuous training from here on out. Well, I don't think there's any doubt who was number one tonight, John. Reynoso left the arena humiliated that night, and vowed to return the favor if they ever met again. But for John, that was the end of the 90 season. Maybe one of the best freestyle seasons of all time. For his efforts, he was awarded the Sullivan Award, becoming the first wrestler to ever win the prize for best amateur athlete. Of course, the Sullivan Award is given each year by the Amateur Athletic Union to the outstanding amateur athlete in the United States. Ten athletes were finalists for the prestigious award. They included Jill Trenary, who talked to us earlier, who won both the U.S. and world titles last year, and Notre Dame's outstanding all-purpose player, Rocket Ishmael, who could be the top pick in April's NFL draft. But both of them were beaten out by a man with the unassuming name of John Smith, who just well may be the best American wrestler of all time. And as John accepted the award in March of 1991, it was just a month until Joe C. would be suspended for lying to NCAA investigators. A move that would pull John out of competing and into the coaching ranks. Could he handle it? Let's find out in episode 6. That's it for episode 5. Thank you so much for tuning in, folks. We'll see you next time. Hey guys, if you want to help us spread the word, please rate the episode and share it with your friends. The Smiths was written and directed by Ryan Warner. Executive producers include USA Wrestling and the National Wrestling Hall of Fame. A special thank you to the entire Smith family, Rich Bender and Leroy Smith. Etched in Stone is an exclusive production of the National Wrestling Hall of Fame and USA Wrestling. Download your free souvenir book of any of the Etched in Stone stories produced at nwhof.org. The storybook includes the written story and is filled with pictures and videos of their live matches. And while you're on the website, take a deeper dive into the profiles of the 179 distinguished members inducted into the National Wrestling Hall of Fame.